So uh, I think many of you would have seen on the invitations to this uh, webinar that you joined uh, that the title uh, was Faster and Easier Ways to Upgrade from Vaadin 8. Uh, obviously, we're very excited about some of the latest things that we've developed uh, that can help Vaadin 8 users along in their journey uh, upgrading to the latest version of Vaadin Flow. Uh, and we, we do want to get uh, to that. But we also want to see this in the general context or the broader context of the work that we've been doing uh, over the years uh, to uh, yeah, close this, this gap, as, as we call it, uh, between uh, Vaadin 8 and uh, Flow, uh, the version of our framework that is built on web components. All right, so uh, we're going to kick off with a review of how we've been doing that over the past years. And uh, the first thing that we're going to look at is just to understand where where this gap comes from and uh, why people are talking about the the gap between Vaadin 8 and Flow and how this came about. So um, Vaadin 8, if you look at the latest version of Vaadin 8, and uh, it's, it's going to be quite comparable to uh, the uh, the feature or the richness of the features that Vaadin 8 had in uh, 2020. Uh, if you look at the API, you'll see that Vaadin 8 had 9,000 more or less uh, methods in the Vaadin API. So there were 9,000 possible methods inside uh, the Vaadin 8 uh, namespace that uh, you could uh, invoke. And at the same time, there were about 1,100 uh, classes in uh, the Vaadin API. So if you had a Vaadin 8 application that was using Vaadin 8, there was like 9,000 uh, methods that you could be invoking, and there were about 1,000, uh, well, 1,100 classes that you could be uh, working with. Now, when Vaadin 10 came out, so this was the first version of Flow, uh, we saw a dramatic shrinkage of the number of uh, methods that were available. So uh, Vaadin Flow, as you're probably aware, this was a complete a redevelopment of the Vaadin platform. Uh, just uh, so much had uh, changed and had to change in order to get us away from uh, the GWT uh, component subsystem uh, that we, we were using and also the engine and uh, to move this to a web components engine and the new APIs that we had around that at the same time as uh, new web standards were coming out. Uh, so there was uh, quite a significant uh, work there just to uh, get the, the first version of Flow out. So if you were looking at Vaadin Flow back in the year 2018 when uh, Flow 10 was released, uh, you would probably see that, yeah, it was very hard uh, to find equivalents for all of the features that Vaadin 8 had uh, at that moment. And um, well, things have changed uh, significantly since the moment that Vaadin Flow uh, 10 was released. We're now on Vaadin version 24.2. Um, actually, this is released today. Uh, it's uh, very interesting to, to note that right now that we're, we're in this webinar, we're actually at the same moment uh, celebrating the, uh, the second minor release of Vaadin Flow 24. Uh, but Vaadin, Floor, Vaadin Flow 24.1, which is when this uh, presentation slide was made, uh, had a significantly larger number of methods and also classes uh, than uh, Vaadin Flow 10 and actually has more classes and methods than Vaadin 8 had. So it's becoming, uh, over time, it's becoming easier and easier uh, to migrate or to upgrade Vaadin 8 applications to Vaadin Flow. Uh, if you're targeting the, the latest versions, there's simply so much, uh, so many features being added there. And you can see this in the numbers of the, the APIs uh, in the, the methods and classes. Let's take a look at some of the features that have been added recently. Some of these features are helping uh, to uh, make it easier to upgrade Vaadin 8 applications to Flow, and we'll look at a, a number of them. So there's some have been come out in uh, in the in the grid. Uh, we have some uh, improvements in uh, the notifications in the dialog, uh, which is the replacement for the the window in Vaadin 8. Uh, some uh, icons, uh, we have uh, improvements, and also uh, some interfaces for better component substitutability. And I'll go through these uh, all uh, just to, to show you how uh, things are getting better. Uh, so one that one easy one to review is the set renderer. 
So in Vaadin 8, uh, we had a method called set render, which allowed you to set or change even the renderer of a column or after it had been created. And Vladin Flow uh, was initially released, so the uh, the renderer could really only be attached to a column at the moment that the column was uh, created uh, in in the grid. Uh, and in Vaadin 24.1, we did reintroduce the uh, set renderer method. So uh, this uh, source code that I'm showing you right now, this would be the exact same source code if you were in Vaadin 8 or Vaadin 24. Uh, you've got the uh, the set renderer method there. Next, uh, tooltips. Um, this is just another area. You know, uh, so many applications use tooltips as well. Uh, tooltips have been available, of course, in uh, in Vaadin for a while. Uh, but of course, when you have multi-value components like uh, grids, uh, tooltips can be a bit more complicated because uh, you often want to show a different tooltip uh, depending on the uh, the content of, of the cell uh, as opposed to uh, the component itself. So let's take a look at some sample Vaadin 8. Uh, here's a Vaadin 8 uh, application that's showing us uh, the way that you would attach or, or the way that you would define a tooltip on cells in a grid. Uh, and we're doing this in two different ways. So Vaadin 8 supported setting tooltips on cells using what they call description generators. <clears throat> and if you assigned a description generator, or if you set a description generator to a column, then uh, that tooltip uh, would be uh, applied to each cell in the in, in in that column. So you could have really cell by cell, you could have control over that. Uh, at the same time, there was another way of doing that that you could uh, assign a description generator to the whole grid, and then you would have a tooltip that would apply to the entire row. Uh, in Flow recently, so in Flow 23.3 uh, and also in Flow uh, 24.1, uh, we've introduced similar concepts. So uh, we now call them tooltip generators, uh, which is, I, I guess, a bit more intuitive uh, to the description generators. And uh, they work in the same way. So if you create a column and you assign, or if you set a tool generator to that column, uh, then you would have uh, different tooltips uh, per uh, cell. And then if you did the same thing, but then to uh, the, the grid in general, then this would be per, per row. So you can see in Vaadin 8, uh, you can do the same thing now in Vaadin 24, and it takes uh, a bit less, a fewer lines of code. Uh, so that's an input even an improvement. Next thing to look at was uh, the grid constructors with data providers. So let's take a look at uh, some of the constructors there. So in Vaadin 8, uh, they did have constructors that contained data providers. This is really just a, uh, a developer convenience that you don't have to set the data provider with a separate setter, but you can include that within the, the constructor of the grid. And uh, now in Vaadin 24.1, uh, uh, we've added uh, a number of constructors to it that take these uh, data providers as well, in addition to uh, collections. Uh, so that is a more equivalence at, uh, at that level. The next thing, uh, well, that's it for, for grid. We also have some things around notifications. So there is a warning variant now. Uh, this was introduced in Vaadin 24.1. Uh, we now have a warning color that has the right contrast uh, that you would need in order to reach the, um, the, the specifications, in order to conform to the accessibility specifications like WCAG. Um, and you can see uh, the designers have, have thought about that. So that's now available so that uh, you can now use this in your code just like you did in Vaadin 8. So in Vaadin 8, you had the ability to make a distinction between warnings and errors. And for a while in Vaadin 24, it wasn't intuitive how to create warnings and errors and to separate them with uh, different visual attributes. Uh, now that's solved, we now have a Luma warning notification variant uh, that you can add to your notification and uh, you can make the same uh, distinction uh, that you were making in, in Vaadin 8. So 
again, uh, bring those uh, features more complete and more in line with uh, Vada 8. And the next one, the dialog. Uh, so uh, there's some constructors that we've added again. So this is once again, a developer convenience, but it's good to have these available so that it's easier to do uh, a line by line uh, code uh, transformation in order to do your upgrade from Vaden 8. So some of the things that we've added there, it will in Vaden 8, uh, it was called a window and the equivalent in Vaden 24 uh, and Vaden flow is called the, the dialogue. And there's modeless and modal windows in uh, Vaden 8, just like you have modeless and modal windows in Vaden 24. And uh, yeah, we now have the same constructors available as well. So uh, that's uh, a better equivalence and easier upgrades. <clears throat> and then the next thing, which I think is, is quite interesting because there's a lot of uh, organizations with uh, applications that used font awesome. Uh, we now have introduced with uh, Vodum 24.2. This is brand new. Uh, this is out uh, today. Uh, the support for third-party icons. So uh, this is the way that it would look in Vaden 24.2. You can now use font icons in your code. And of course, an example of a font icon would be the font awesome. Uh, so you can uh, actually include font awesome in your application again. You don't need uh, to resort to um, uh, add-ons in the directory. Uh, all you need to do is include the uh, the CSS here and in, inside your project, and then you'll be able to access this in, in your code. Uh, so Font Awesome uh, has the font icons now uh, available with it, but of course, Font Awesome also has um, uh, SVG sprites, uh, so you could have used the SVG icons as well, uh, but now this is just uh, yeah full support for uh, these third-party icons. That is going to help a lot of people, especially if they were coming from Vaden 7. Um, and then another thing that we added in Vaden 24.2 is interfaces for better component substitutability. So something that we saw in uh, in a lot of Vaden 8 and also Vaden 7 applications was that um, the applications would create a number of components and then add them to a uh, to a layout. And then uh, at certain points or in reaction to certain events in the application, the code would iterate over all the children in the container and then perform some action on it, like set a style name or uh, make them visible or make them enabled, for example. <clears throat> and that was uh, possible because, uh, yeah, in Vaden 8, there we had these component interfaces and the abstract component class and these were very rich classes. They had a lot of methods uh, that they implemented. And of course, all the components in Vaden 8 uh, supported all of these, these methods. So component interface had 29 uh, methods and the abstract component class had 73. In Flow, things are somewhat different uh, because we wanted to make it more easy, <coughs> excuse me, to create uh, new components so that you could have Instead, the system of mixing interfaces uh, so that uh, your components could implement the interfaces that uh, were needed for uh, your specific components. Uh, this did, of course, come at a bit of a, a cost of the uh, substitutability. So with uh, Vaden 24.2, we've implemented this input field interface, which is a new interface in Vaden Flow uh, that uh, contains uh, they has enabled, has label, has tooltip, has style, has size, and has value um, uh, interfaces. It, ex uh, it extends them all. And uh, these are now available on a wide variety of uh, uh, components, like uh, the text field, the check marks, and other things that you would normally find in the form and that you might uh, you know, um, want to uh, execute a number of uh, operations on in, in the same way, uh, regardless if they are a checkbox or a date picker or a custom field. Okay, so that's uh, now available as well, and that should help in upgrading from uh, Vada 8 as well. 
Okay, so everything that I've just discussed is uh, related to features that have been added to Flow. Uh, we also have a number of things that we've added outside of Flow, and uh, the three things that you know you might have already heard of already, and they've been in action for some time. Those are uh, the upgrade assessments, the MPR, and uh, the classic components. So upgrade assessments, we've been doing these for a while. Really, this is helping companies uh, answer questions. Uh, so uh, in the situation, or, or let's say when an organization is in a situation that they have a VOD and 8 application and they're considering you know, what is involved with uh, upgrading this application to Flow, uh, it's typically uh, a, a situation that they haven't uh, done before. So they, they don't have a lot of experience and they don't uh, understand what would be involved, how uh, complicated that that actually would be, especially seeing uh, the latest developments in, in Flow and, and also in Vodan 8, uh, how that would affect uh, the upgrade. So the upgrade assessments help them, um, and there's a variety of stakeholders uh, that uh, would be helped by, by these. Um, an upgrade assessment, it's a project, uh, it takes two weeks. Uh, this is when companies would share the source code of their VOD8 application. And then uh, we would have experts uh, looking at the application and uh, also doing a static analysis of the application with some proprietary tools that we have in order to give a final presentation where we uh, say like uh, the, the estimates of what we would estimate in terms of uh, effort needed and how using different tools and techniques uh, would be able to uh, uh, save uh, time or and reduce the uh, the number of defects that you would have with the upgrade. The next one is, of course, uh, MPR. That was actually one of the first ones that we uh, introduced as a tool. Uh, the multi-platform runtime. Um, this is a coexistence tool that gives you a, a new, uh, excuse me, it's an old and new containerization coexistence. So uh, the way that you would do this is uh, you would be able to do the upgrade from Vodden 8 to Vodden 24 by first creating a new Vodden 24 application. And then you would use MPR to cut out a piece inside that new Vodden 24 application. And inside that uh, a, a place that would be the, the multi-platform legacy wrapper, uh, inside that wrapper, you could then insert your Vodden 8 application and uh, run both at the same time. Uh, so there's uh, the different client engines that are being run inside the browser and different namespaces inside the Java uh, that you would have on the server. And uh, this way you can do a gradual transformation from uh, Vada 8 to Vada 24. This is really useful for companies uh, in order to, well, it's, it's especially useful for companies that are in a situation where there's uncertainty or uncertainty about the availability of resources to uh, conclude the project. <clears throat> These could be developer resources and they could also be tester resources. Uh, so especially uh, we see many organizations that are able to have very large applications in production, but with a very small team of testers and obviously, these testers uh, are used to uh, testing increments of uh, the, uh, the, the, the software, and uh, they're, they're able to test the increments, uh, but not organized to be able to retest um, everything all from scratch if there would be uh, you know, a, a huge upgrade <clears throat> uh, like this. Uh, so this allows the, uh, well, the, the organization and also the, the people doing the project uh, to take it at uh, a pace where they can ensure the quality of the upgrade. Okay, and then one of the newer things that we have is uh, classic components. And classic components, these are a set of uh, new components that we've created that are, in essence, they are Vodden 24 components or Vodden 23. Uh, we have a version also, and these components uh, implement the behavior and also API and DOM structure of a selected number of components from Vodden 8. Uh, so the idea is that this is another way of uh, accelerating the project and um, 
the way that these components work is that uh, they really do achieve a polymorphism between the components that uh, exist in Vaden24 and also the, um, the, the behavior and also inheritance hierarchy of the components in Vaden8. So here's just one example uh, of one classic component that we have, which is horizontal layout. So you see in Vaden 8, we had a horizontal layout, but in Vaden 24, we also have a horizontal layout. In Vaden 24, horizontal layout, just like any other component, it extends from flow component. And so the classic component version of horizontal layout is also going to extend from uh, the flow component. And then what uh, the classic component version of horizontal layout then adds to that is every single layer. Uh, that uh, the Vaden 8 version used to have, and uh, it also implements the same uh, DOM. So uh, here is an example uh, that you might have seen before, but here we have a simple horizontal layout uh, with four buttons in it, and this is Vaden 8. So the DOM for this would look uh, like this. So we have divs and divs with certain classes, but in Vaden24, that same thing is very, very different because we're using different components. We're using the web component standards uh, together with the, the Shadow DOM. So there's a horizontal layout here, and there's also these buttons, uh, but the DOM is just very different. So what uh, Classic Components does is it runs in Vaden24, and it also has uh, the APIs of the Vaden8 uh, version of the component, and it's also polymorphic with uh, Vaden24 components, and it has uh, the same um, uh, DOM structure. And this is useful for in, uh, situations when there's more complicated layouts happening on the basis of the uh, classic components, especially uh, things commonly used like horizontal layout and vertical layout. OK, the next thing that I'll talk about is the upgrade automation tool. So this is the probably the, the most newest thing that we have uh, available and that we've been able to introduce. So there are, we've been able to identify uh, just because, you know, there are many thousands of uh, APIs in, in Vada 8, but there are uh, certainly a thousand uh, or so simple transformations or simple substitutions uh, that you can apply to a Vada 8 application in order to get that closer to what Vaden24 is expecting. It's like set selected item uh, in certain situations in Vaden8. This can just be replaced uh, in Vaden24 by a set value. Of course, it has to happen in the right context, um, but, uh, but it is there. And that is a situation that's, well, that's a transformation that's valid. So a thousand of these substitutions, a thousand of these little changes, you know, if you're looking at your application source code, you might have one compilation unit, you might have one Java file where maybe only one change needs to take place. And then uh, another class that you might have defined, well, maybe there's a, a large number of changes that uh, can take place. You might have a class where nothing needs to change at all. Or you might have a class where there's different methods and every single statement inside uh, these different methods uh, does need to be changed. So <clears throat> this, is, this can be quite chaotic work because every class in your application, every compilation unit uh, can be very different and each one can require a different amount of, uh, of, of changes. And if the changes are well known and there are simple changes available, uh, then certainly it's going to be less error prone if uh, we are able to automate this instead of having to do all of these changes manually. Because many applications out there are 100 or 200,000 lines of code. And um, yeah, applying thousands of changes to 200,000 lines of code, that's, uh, that's uh, definitely an, an error prone work. So upgrade automation, there's a tool that we've created. Uh, it's code name of it, that's a code name that we use internally. We call it Dragonfly, and it does convert your code from using a Vaden API, Vaden 8 API usage to Vaden Flow 23 or 24. Uh, so yes, it does use an abstract syntax tree, so it's doing that correctly. It's not just uh, doing regular expressions. 
uh, but it's doing that correctly and doing it uh, according to the uh, language version of your project. And uh, there's conversion rules uh, that we've uh, implemented. So that uh, that's these uh, thousands of, of rules that we have. Uh, we apply, well, the, the tool will apply these uh, rules to the AST and it does do this in a smart way. So we're using type resolvers. So obviously we're expecting that when you're upgrading from Vaadin 8 to Vaadin 24, that the Vaadin 8 jar is going to disappear as a dependency and the Vaadin 24 jar is going to reappear. So making certain changes is going to uh, help. Uh, but of course, uh, it's not going to help if you've created methods of your own in your own application that happen to have the same name or signature as Vaadin applications uh, or as the, the Vaadin API and uh, the, the tool would uh, make these invalid. So we do have a resolver built into the tool uh, so that it is identifying correctly which methods uh, are uh, what, what the binding is of these methods so that we're uh, leaving those alone that, that should be left alone and that we are changing the ones that do need to be changed. All right. Um, so many developers, they can be quite uh, nervous when uh, they hear about some automated changes to their source code. So we do have a number of design principles in uh, the Dragonfly uh, tool in order to ensure the maintainability of uh, the code. So first of all, we're minimizing the changes. We want to make as few changes as possible. So we're not changing comments. Uh, any comments that exist, they, they stay where they are. Uh, the white space stays where it is. We don't change the naming of any classes or the number of Java files. Uh, basically everything that stays the same. And what we're aiming for is single line substitutions so that if you have a, a source code of 1,000 lines of code, uh, you wouldn't expect that to suddenly be 3,000 lines of code once it had been processed by uh, the Dragonfly tool. Uh, this should be very close to uh, the original 1,000 lines of code that you had uh, in the beginning. And then, of course, there's full logging of all the changes uh, so that if you want to know what exactly has happened, uh, what has the upgrade automation tool done, uh, that you can get this uh, information and share it uh, with your colleagues mm -hmm. and your developers. So here is an example. This is really what you should expect uh, from the upgrade automation in terms of output. So taking this Vaadin 8 here on the left, you would see something that looks like the bottom 24 on the right, and it really is a line by line uh, transformation and uh, substitutions applied that way. All right, um, that is it. What I wanted to share about uh, the automation tool. Uh, Daniele will uh, come up next and talk about the service. Thank you. Um, so um, let's talk about uh, the service that we have available um, to help you <laughs> migrate your application. Um, so we divided uh, this uh, schema here between uh, the first step, which is preparation, uh, because it's always useful to have a plan uh, and to understand how to prepare um, each one of the resources before uh, going through the uh, migration process. Um, which is then inside this execution side of uh, the graph. So in the first part, uh, we can see that uh, the best way is to start pre uh, preparing for a migration uh, is to go through an upgrade assessment, uh, which is um, the process of analyzing your application uh, that Ben just described to you. And then we have the green light, uh, which is something that we uh, use to plan uh, internally in the company. Uh, the process of uh, the migration, so how to organize uh, resources and who to assign to which task uh, to optimize uh, then the following steps. Uh, we do have uh, some um, services about UX uh, review, uh, which uh, takes into account the usability of the application, the changes that you need to apply to the theming and the look and feel of your application. And, and then uh, we have the V8 upgrade automation. Uh, the, the other elements that we have in the execution side of this graph 
um, are, are all um, things that uh, apply changes to your application. So it's actually more doing than planning. Uh, one thing that is usually um, planned uh, is a foundation, uh, which is uh, getting help from Vadin to kickstart your migration. So during foundation process, uh, we uh, take uh, care of helping you uh, during the first steps, uh, like changing how the routing of your views are defined, how your abstractions and your frameworks and your dependencies uh, should be changed uh, before doing the actual view by view migration. And, and then we have some custom component changes. So for example, uh, if you have a specific custom component uh, that you designed yourself, uh, that does something that uh, wasn't already in Vadin core, um, we uh, find a way uh, to achieve the same behavior in Vadin 24. And beside that, uh, there are some elements about prime subscription offerings, which you can see here at the bottom, uh, which are elements that are uh, included, included as a package um, in body subscriptions. So uh, we have classic components, uh, NPR that uh, uh, Ben just described. And then we have um, expert chat, uh, which includes someone in Vadin ready to help you uh, answer your questions, which uh, can be how um, some, it could be like um, how some code should be changed, uh, understanding uh, errors or problems or uh, something that could come up uh, with the, uh, the development process. And uh, a mentor, which is someone from Vadin, actually being integrated uh, in another company, uh, working uh, with, a, uh, with a scheduled um, uh, basis. So for example, every uh, week or every month, um, someone could uh, come into uh, the development process internally and understands uh, the issues and provide some guidance. Um, beside all, all of these uh, packages that we usually offer, um, we are going to focus today on the V8 upgrade automation, where, which is going to be described in the next slide. Uh, the upgrade automation uh, is a service. So uh, it, uh, it, it, it starts uh, by um, us uh, taking an application inside uh, our company, which means that the customer will need to share uh, the source code if it's, uh, of its application along with the dependencies. Uh, we do need the dependencies uh, because we need to understand uh, how Vadin is being used. Uh, so we need, for example, uh, if the application is using Maven, uh, the uh, local repository export, or same for Gradle and so on. Um, but we do not need to run the applications. So uh, to execute the upgrade automation service, uh, we, don't we do not need a database or a testing environment. Uh, after that, uh, for a week, our um, experts work on the upgrade automation service. And at the end of it, uh, the converted source code is given back to the customer. Uh, the, uh, the result is going to be the Java project uh, with changed sources, uh, which included the effect of the automation and uh, some compilation configuration changes. So for example, uh, POM files or Gradle configuration files will need to be uh, changed uh, to use Vadin 24 instead of Vadin 8 uh, to be able to compile the application or test uh, the compilation unit. So obviously, uh, these changes made to the POMs or the Gradle um, compilation units uh, are not final uh, because then uh, the, the customer could, uh, could have the need to change those uh, files afterwards uh, to be integrated in their own system. For example, if they're using um, a local Nexus um, server or something similar. So let's focus more on uh, what is going to happen during this week in the next slide, which is uh, after the uh, code gets uh, delivered, uh, the expert will uh, use uh, our internal tooling to parse the input Java sources into the abstract syntax tree. Then uh, over that um, tree, we are going to apply the rules and uh, we are going to choose which rules to apply 
because sometimes uh, some rules could be conflicting with, with each other. There could be ways to convert specific line of code in different ways in Vadin 24. So there is not, not always one way uh, to convert Vadin 8 to Vadin 24. So our expert will uh, analyze the result and try to find the best um, set of rules to apply to optimize the gains uh, from the automation. So this process gets reiterated uh, internally in Vadin until we are sure uh, that we are using uh, the perfect rule set uh, to uh, reduce the work uh, that uh, you will need to do at the end of the automation. After the automation is done, uh, some additional changes will need to be applied, uh, which is going to be uh, manual uh, because sometimes some elements will, uh, will not have a conversion into Vadin 24. So the automation is, gonna, is not going to reach a 100% conversion. Uh, so the rest of the changes will need to be uh, developed manually. And at the end, the migration will be complete. So in the, in the next slide, uh, we are going to see uh, the result of it. So after a week, um, the project will be returned uh, along with a detailed report of applied changes. So you will have a, a document that states all the changes that have been applied and why. Uh, th this could be extremely long if you have a very big application. Um, the compilation errors uh, that uh, you will need to be ex uh, expect by the result. And we are going to give you some tips on how to handle them manually. Probably you will need to change, for example, uh, your binding situation or some other elements. And uh, at the end, uh, I, I wish to remind you that uh, the automation will not cover everything that is not Java. So for example, uh, the themes uh, will not be automated, for example, CSS files. Uh, the same is for any non-Java-based declaratives. So if you use Vadine Designer, the automation will only migrate uh, the Java part of it. So if you added uh, some uh, listeners to your buttons or your, comp or your components, those will be uh, converted. Uh, but uh, the, 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 the descriptor itself, uh, which is not a Java file, uh, is not included in the automation. And at, at, at least um, the third party add-ons, uh, those will not be converted. Uh, and then uh, usually there is a question remaining, which is, uh, should I use the automation? What is going to be the gains that I'm going to get from it? How much of my code is going to be um, it's going to be migrated. What are the optimization that you can apply to my code? And I will let Ben answer this question. All right. Thanks, Daniele. So um, the answer to that question is Minifinder. Uh, this is something brand new that we've created. This is well, the newest thing that we're going to introduce today. Uh, you will uh, be able to download that uh, from our website uh, at the end of this uh, webinar, actually. I will give you instructions for how that works. Uh, so as Daniele was explaining, yes, indeed, Vaden 8 has a huge, Vaden 8 is, is just really, really huge. Uh, there are many methods, many classes, and uh, we've been able to analyze a, a large number of these thousands of methods and classes to look for individual uh, transformation or mappability of the, method, uh, of the methods or features in the modern flow, uh, but we're certainly not at 100% of this number. And of course, many of the things that uh, are that do exist uh, do have transformable equivalents, uh, but also many don't. Uh, so in the past, uh, the way that we have been helping companies to understand how the tools would affect their specific application would be to go through the upgrade assessment, uh, where we would show them or we'd be able to give estimates on uh, the amount of hours that they would need to be spending uh, dealing with the various uh, components that they have in their application and how much uh, they would be able to save uh, by working with classic components. And then uh, we would also be able to look at uh, the notion of coverage, uh, the coverage for the upgrade automation and the Dragonfly tool for the uh, methods that were included in all of the uh, classes. So of course, the, the tool is able to, to calculate that quite uh, quickly and uh, in, in great detail. And we can include that uh, full information in the upgrade assessment 
uh, because that that is a project to, as as I was saying that that does take two weeks. Um, but uh, right, so upgrade assessment is 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 one way to do that. But there's an easier way, and we know that there's a, a need for an, an easier way to get access to uh, the coverage uh, estimations uh, of the migration. Excuse me, of the upgrade automation uh, when applied to an individual uh, application. And uh, our answer to that is a small tool that we've developed called MiniFinder. And uh, MiniFinder is a tool that you will be able to run over your application without having to send your application source code to Vaadin. Uh, so this is a free tool that you would be able to access and it would produce information that would look like this. Uh, so this importantly, it gives you the coverage statistics for method invocations and constructor invocations. Of course, uh, not everything in your application that needs to be changed is going to be method invocations or constructor invocations, uh, but this does give us a good sense of the coverage. Obviously, uh, types also need to be changed, uh, and that's uh, also a big part. Uh, but this already gives us a very good idea of uh, the coverage and uh, helps us identify if there are any uh, big uh, uh, but let's say things that uh, you have used in, in your application that uh, would be uh, falling through the cracks or, or not covered by the, uh, by the automation. So we have the summary information that it uh, displays, but it also gives you a breakdown by the five most, uh, by the five classes that you've used the most. And uh, the invocations uh, that, that you've used the most that have been declared in the top five classes uh, so that's also interesting. So you can see very often for some of the methods that have been used the most, the coverage is 100%, uh, but it does uh, dwindle down sometimes for some of the more uh, rarely used uh, methods or methods that might, for example, be linked with the GWT. MiniFinder comes in two varieties. Uh, we've got two flavors of it. We have a MiniFinder as an Eclipse plugin, and we also have MiniFinder as a Maven plugin. So MiniFinder as Eclipse, this, well, both of these are free. <clears throat> so there's, there's, there's no cost for it. And uh, it means, I mean, and both of these work under the system of, uh, you can download the tool, run it over your code, and you don't have to show uh, or share your code uh, outside your organization. Uh, so you continue to own that process. Uh, Eclipse would be the easiest to install because this comes packaged in a jar and you can simply drop this jar uh, into your uh, drop-ins folder. Uh, on Maven, it is, yeah, it, it's going to be on Maven Central and available through the Vaadin directory. Uh, so um, it would be slightly more complex to set up uh, using Maven. Uh, but uh, yeah, if you, for example, don't use Eclipse in your organization, but you do use Maven, then uh, this would uh, possibly be an easy way for you to get started. Uh, you would just need to make some changes to your palm.xml, and then you uh, can download this uh, from uh, our directory. It's actually available in, in our directory. You would need an internet connection. We know that's an issue for some organizations that they can't uh, connect their software to uh, the internet, uh, that that could be a problem. Uh, so in case security is really such in your organization that you really don't want to uh, connect uh, this uh, software that uh, perhaps is unknown or hasn't been vetted by your security department, uh, then you can do this on a computer uh, that isn't connected to the internet and uh, you can use the Eclipse version. Uh, so that could work for you as well. All right, uh, well, that is briefly what MiniFinder is. Uh, so the idea is that you would get a little report like this. And once you get it, um, yeah, there would be some numbers coming out of it, and then you could discuss it with uh, your uh, Vaadin uh, account executive uh, to see what, what next steps uh, would be. And uh, Daniele is now going to uh, demo uh, MiniFinder uh, for us. Yes, I will show you um, how MiniFinder is uh, used locally. Uh, let me remind you that the MiniFinder result is an estimation. Uh, so it's, um, it's not that exact percentage that you will get. Uh, that is going to be uh, what the, the service is going to provide. It could be slightly higher or slightly lower. Uh, 
so I'm sharing my screen now. So as you can see, I have an uh, Eclipse application here. Um, so in this application, I have a very simple uh, Badinate application with uh, some classes. Um, this is uh, a, a simple class that uh, it just having a button and I have other classes um, here that, uh, that does some uh, Vadin work um, and Vadin uh, usages. So if I want to understand what is the percentage of uh, this application uh, coverage of the automation, it um, is done by going inside the Eclipse folder. So I'm, I'm using a Mac here, but uh, it's going to be the same if you're using Linux or uh, Windows uh, operative system. So you go inside the package content of Eclipse, and you go inside contents, and then inside Eclipse, and you have a folder here, which is one drop-ins, and you put the Minifinder jar inside that, or you go inside the plugins folder and you put it there. So this will uh, install the Minifinder inside Eclipse, and when you restart uh, your Eclipse application, you will see a new button here, uh, which is uh, the Vadin icon, and you will have a menu uh, item here too, between run and window with the Vadin symbol. So when you click this button, uh, this uh, uh, dialog will pop up. Uh, you will just need to accept default settings. And when you click OK in your console um, at the bottom, you will have the report. So let me remind you that only console is gonna show it, not terminal. So you will need to make sure that uh, you have your console uh, view up by going to window, uh, show view console. Inside this uh, report, you will see the result, which is the coverage. So you will see the total number of method invocation done uh, to Vadin, the total number of construction invocation, and how many of them are covered. So the coverage means that we do have at least one rule that is targeting uh, that specific uh, Vadin usage. Uh, if you would like to use uh, Eclipse, then you can go to the POM file. Let me, yes, like that. We can go to the POM file and go in the plugin description and add our plugin. So this is a snapshot version uh, because I am developing, but uh, you can use the, uh, the one that we released on our um, add-ons folder. So if you go to uh, Vadin, um, directory, you will find the Minifinder um, Vadin plugin, and you and you can just copy paste the plugin text here inside your POM file. Uh, to run that, you open a terminal on your um, on the root of your project. Uh, yes, and then you can just run uh, the command Minifinder uh, Minifinder, and these will. Uh, give you the same report that we just saw on Eclipse. Uh, be careful uh, that there is one little difference between the two tools. Uh, Eclipse is going to run the Minifinder on your entire workspace. So if you have more than one project, uh, for example, you have sub-modules, so you're using uh, what is called uh, the Maven sub-modules and things like that, uh, the result is going to be different. Uh, Eclipse is going to give you the entire result, uh, taking into account your entire workspace, uh, while uh, the Maven plugin is going to give you a report for each one of your sub-modules. So sometimes it's useful to have only sub-modules result, uh, while sometimes uh, is helpful to have the entire workspace. So you can choose between the, the Maven version or the Eclipse version, or you can use both. Uh, depending on your needs. Um, I think I should stop sharing. I don't need, I don't know how. Okay, thank okay, you. Am I, I think I'm sharing now, yes. All right, well. Uh, thank you, Daniel. That is it. That brings us through uh, the the demo and the presentation that we had. Um, I hope this was useful to you. Um, we have some minutes for questions. If someone has questions, we can try to answer them now. Yes, thank you very much, Ben and Daniele. Uh, we have a list of questions. I can start through them. 
We still have Button 7 applications. Does NPR and Upgrade Automation help Button 7 apps? Right, I, I can probably take that one. So uh, Vaadin 7 uh, is compatible with uh, MPR. Uh, so uh, that that is actually the case. So it is possible to start my, well, to start upgrading directly from Vaadin 7 to the latest Vaadin flow using MPR. I mean, MPR is compatible with uh, Vaadin 24 still. Uh, so if you want to make the leap from Vaadin 7 all the way up to Vaadin uh, 24, you can absolutely do that uh, with MPR. Uh, the same thing holds for classic components. So classic components are also compatible with uh, Vaadin 7. Uh, the Vaadin 8 upgrade automation is not compatible with Vaadin 7. Um, that is, um, yeah, that, that's, that's not something that, that is supported. Uh, it, it simply does not uh, have these rules. Um, so uh, it's possible that you might have an application that's running a combination of Vaadin 7 and also Vaadin 8. Uh, you might be using the compatibility package uh, to have both, or you might be gradually migrating from Vaadin 7 to Vaadin 8. Uh, so uh, even if you're in that situation, then yeah, you can use MPR. You can also use classic components. But if you would use Vaadin 8 upgrade automation, uh, this would only affect the parts of your application that are already in the bottom eight. <clears throat> right. Second question. I am missing a list of Vaadin 7 classes and their corresponding replacements in Vaadin 24. Does that exist somewhere? Um, we would have that for uh, components. Um, I think the last place that I saw the last updated uh, sheet was in the Vaadin 14 docs. So, um, it, it, so yeah, no one is saying that you need to upgrade to Vaadin 14 if you're currently on Vaadin 7. It's simply that uh, the documentation for upgrading from um, Vaadin 7 or Vaadin 8 uh, to Flow, it's on the uh, it's it, it's in that location in our uh, in our documentation. Uh, so you'd want to look on the Vaadin 14 document uh, page in order to see that. Uh, and that's going to help you understand the, uh, the components. But I believe your question specifically asked about classes. So if you're interested in uh, understanding better how to deal with the classes, then I think the best re resource for you would be the release notes of Vaadin 8 because Vaadin 8 uh, contains a lot of uh, information about how the uh, classes, especially the binding classes, have been affected and how that's uh, changed in Vaadin 8. Um, so uh, going from Vaadin 7 to Vaadin 8, this, I mean, the, the emphasis on classes was actually more with uh, the upgrade from Vaadin 7 to Vaadin 8. The upgrade from Vaadin 8 to Vaadin Flow is more on components uh, because uh, we shifted from uh, the GWT components to, to the web components. Um, so I would say for classes, you're probably best, your best bet would be to looking at the Vaadin 8.0 release notes. Uh, that contains a lot of interesting uh, information about the, the Vaadin 7 classes. And for the components, then I would suggest the Vaadin 14 documentation about upgrading from Vaadin 8. I hope that helps. All right. There are a few questions that are very similar. That is, where can I find the automation tool and can I run it myself? Um, I can answer that. So the automation tool um, is only available uh, internally. So it's something that we are using um, to provide uh, the upgrade automation uh, service. Um, we we cannot uh, we we are not going, giving the tool. Uh, directly to the customer because it's not something that um, a customer can use uh, freely in a sense that uh, we have many many rules uh, that need to be contextualized so our experts uh, have conflicting rules and they need to choose uh, which one rule to use and this process is uh, reiterative so it's not uh, one shot and this is why we deliver the result back after a week All right. 
Uh, next question, what about migrations of bhtml? I think this is also related to the automation tool. Vaad and HTML? Yeah, Daniela was talking about that actually, about the designer. Yes, we, we do not uh, migrate anything that is not Java. So if you used uh, the designer or you enriched some HTML as a template, uh, the automation will change the Java code uh, linked to it. So uh, all the uh, event listeners and everything that is uh, surrounding the HTML is being uh, migrated, but not the HTML itself. Okay. Can the cover scheme convert the classic classes? Sorry, can the conversion convert the classic classes? Uh, yes. So, I mean, the, 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 that is the default. So uh, the, the default of the default behavior of the Vaadin 8 upgrade automation is a transformation to a Vaadin 24 application that uses classic components. So they will, they will be there. All right. Um, how do you support third-party migrations? Are there any services available? Um, it depends by what third party uh, means. So if we have, uh, if you're using a third party component, like for example, an add-on or something like that, uh, we do provide services. So we analyze the problem during upgrade automation, during upgrade assessments, and we give estimation usually um, to our customer on how much it will take to replicate the same behavior in Vadin 24 or is possible to provide a service uh, for that specific uh, component itself. So we can uh, work into creating the same component uh, in Vadin24 um, ad hoc uh, for the customer. So it just uh, shows us what it does, uh, shares with us um, how it's using it, and maybe the source code if it's uh, something that they, own, that, that they developed on their own, and we, we develop it for them. All right, we're a little bit over time, but if you still have a few minutes, there is there are a few more questions still. Um, for example, where can I download the mini finder for Eclipse? I couldn't find the documentation. So mini finder for Eclipse, uh, this is a jar and you would need to contact your uh, account executive to give you access to the, the folder so that you could download it. <clears throat> All right, um, next question. In Vadin 8, almost every component supported HTML captions and tooltips. Do you plan to bring this feature back? Uh, there, there, I, I, I don't, do, do you want to take this one, Daniela? Otherwise, I can, I can try. Yes, please okay. try. Oh, yes, please. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel. Um, yeah, so that, that is not, as I've understood it, it, uh, it is somewhat supported. Um, so there are uh, HTMLs that you can include in <clears throat> the, the, uh, the tooltips uh, in addition to the, uh, the text. Um, I've seen an example just yesterday on our documentation where uh, they were looking at the tooltips and they were including both um, uh, right no um, I, I, I might be confusing some things. Um, I, I'm, I'm probably not the best person to answer that question because we we don't have the uh, uh, the, the folks from uh, design systems on this call. I'm, I, I shouldn't talk about the uh, the future plans. Uh, sorry, I should not be the person answering this one. Do you have better information, Daniel? I think my answer will probably be the same. Okay. Or similar. <clears throat> All right. And um, there's also a question. Does custom layout have an equivalent in Flow? Um, I, I think our recommendation was to use a div. Is that right? It uh, depends. Um, custom layout can be migrated in many ways. 
um, yes, a div or a span or a CSS. I, I, I don't know. It's, a, it, it, it's very specific. Uh, we, we need to see the context. Yeah. OK, maybe the last question that we can take today. Do I need to buy a license to upgrade from Valin 8 to Valin 24? Um, no, in a sense that potentially um, you could do everything manually. You can just uh, start working on that and do the migration by yourself. And that will be totally free and you will never need to contact Vadin at all. Uh, what we can give is help. So the upgrade automation is uh, just one week service uh, and is one shot. Um, so after the week, you will have the, the result and then you can just work on yourself uh, without having any license. Uh, obviously, if you want to have more help, like having, I don't know, NPR or classic components, uh, those are licensed um, elements. Uh, but keep in mind that both NPR and classic components doesn't need to stay there forever. Uh, at some point, uh, you, you will be able to remove them uh, at the end of the migration, uh, and so you will not need a license anymore. All right, great. We managed to go through most of the questions. Thank you very much, Ben and Daniele. Uh, and if anyone else has questions still, just feel free to reach out to us. And we'll try to answer. Thank you very much and have a very nice day. Thank you. Okay. Have a nice day. Thank you.